thoughts on the remainder and factor theorems? Okay, these are kind of weird theorems. We don't use them a ton, but uh, they are kind of important. So, uh, the remainder and factor theorems. So, it says when working with polynomials, we will be using synthetic division. So, if you thought it was going to go away, it did not go away. Uh, we're going to use synthetic division to divide this polynomial, 5x cubed, minus 13x squared, plus 10x minus 8, and we're going to divide it by x minus 2. So, when I divide by x minus 2, what do I put in the backwards out? Positive 2, that's right. It's always the 0 of the divisor. It's if we set the divisor equal to 0 and solve, we would get x equals 2. Okay, now some of you guys messed up your synthetic division on the final. You do weird things like you put a 5 here and then you add straight down and get 10. We don't do that. We always drop the first term, so we put a 5 down. And then remember, it's the lattice method, so whenever we have a diagonal line, we multiply. So 2 times 5 is 10. Add straight down and get negative 3. 2 times negative 3 is negative 6. Add straight down, I get 4. 2 times 4 is 8. Add straight down, I get 0. And this time we have a remainder of 0. Well, what that means is that it has factored evenly. Okay, so 2 is a factor of the original polynomial. So it means that we factored p of x into the divisor, x minus 2, times this new thing, the quotient. So 5x squared minus 3x plus 4. Okay, so let's think about it. If I was finding p of 2, and I plug 2 into the original, or the factored form, what happens when I plug in 2? What do I get? I have the 5x squared minus 3x. It doesn't matter which one you're plugging it into. So let's say I plug it in right here. What happens when I plug in 2? I get 0. So it means that 2 is a 0 of the original polynomial. In other words, it means that it's an x-intercept. So all of these things are going to be related. Okay, so if something factors, it means it's a zero. It means that the remainder was zero. Um, it means that it uh, is an x-intercept. All of these things are interrelated. Okay, and it actually goes a step further. If I do my synthetic division on any number, so let's say I plug in seven into some kind of polynomial and I get a remainder of ten, that means that p of 7 is 10. That's a point, right? It's 7 comma 10. Okay, that's what the remainder theorem says. So it doesn't even have to factor evenly. Whatever you get as your remainder is the same thing as if you plugged in the, the 7 into the original polynomial. Do you guys see what I'm saying? It's kind of confusing. Okay, so that's what the remainder theorem says. It says if the polynomial p of x is divided by some divisor x minus a, your remainder ends up being the same as p of a if you just plugged in A into the original polynomial. Just, uh, that we're doing the remainder theorem. So, and then we went a step further. We said, well, if it's zero, that means that it factored evenly. So we found a zero of the polynomial. That's the second part of the remainder theorem, which we call the factor theorem. So these go together. So the factor theorem just says x minus A is a factor if, when you plug in A, you get zero out, or if you do synthetic division, your remainder is zero. Okay, so let's, let's see how these are used. Okay, so number one, it says let p of x equal 5x cubed plus 32x squared minus 11x plus 75. Okay, find the quotient and remainder when you divide by x plus 7. So in your backwards L, we put a negative 7. And your original, your dividend, right, is the 5, 32, negative 11, 75. Remember to put in zeros if you were missing anything. We drop the 5. Okay, so do the synthetic division along with me. It's hard when you're just kind of copying what I'm writing, but it's easy if you're kind of thinking along with me. So negative 7 times 5 is negative 35. Add straight down, I get negative 3. Negative 7 times negative 3 is 21. Add straight down, I get 10. Negative 7 times 10 is negative 70. Add straight down, I get 5. So Tyler was saying, well, what have, what have we just learned? What we just learned is that if I plug in negative 7 into my original polynomial, I should get 5. That's what we just learned. It's kind of a weird way of plugging in numbers, right? We also found our quotient and our remainder. Our quotient is 5x squared minus 3x plus 10, just like before, like in our chapter 5. And our remainder is 5. So that's what B says. It says use that remainder theorem to find P of negative 7. So that's why I was saying P of negative 7 is just whatever the remainder was when we plugged in negative 7 here. Okay? Mm -hmm. Once you factor all out, your answer is just negative 7 over 5. The remainder is your, yeah. 
Okay, so could we do this a long way? Like, how did we learn how to find, like, f of 2 or f of negative 6 before? We would just plug them in, right? Well, what if we do that? So what if I find p of negative 7 this way? 5 times negative 7 cubed plus 32 times negative 7 squared minus 11 times negative 7 plus 75. That's a little bit harder than the synthetic division was. The synthetic division I knew in, like, 5 seconds, right? This one, I, negative 7 cubed. Do you guys know that off the top of your head? Negative 343. Do you guys know? Most of you guys don't know that, right? So we do it. So we do 5 times negative 7 cubed. And you can do it all on your calculator. So I'm plugging it all in. I end up getting 5. Crazy, huh? Okay, so it can be very useful. If you're doing like t-tables or something, you have really, really a big polynomial with big numbers. It can be faster to do synthetic division. Okay, but we really use it for that second theorem, which is the factor theorem. That's really where the remainder theorem is important. It's, it's uh, the remainder theorem, a more general or a more specific form of it is the factor theorem. Okay, so it says use synthetic division to decide which numbers in the list, negative 1, negative 2, 3, and 1, must be zeros of our polynomial. So we're going to see which ones factor evenly, which ones have a remainder of 0. So we have 1x cubed, negative 2x squared, minus 5x plus 6. And we're trying negative 1, negative 2, 3, and 1. Okay, so I drop the 1. So negative 1 times 1 is negative 1. Add straight down, I get negative 3. Negative 1 times negative 3 is 3. Add straight down, I get negative 2. Negative 1 times negative 2 is 2. Add straight down, I get 8. So did it factor evenly? No. So negative 1 did not work. It's out. Now we try negative 2. So I have 1, negative 2, negative 5, and 6. So negative 2, I get negative 4, 8, 3, negative 6, 0. Did it work? Yes. So that means negative 2 factored evenly. So negative 2 worked. Uh huh. So negative 2 works. So that means x plus 2, right, if I was factoring it, if I was writing its divisor in the quotient, it would be x plus 2. A lot of people get confused. They're like, wait, when do I switch the sign? Like, if you're just trying the numbers, you just keep the sign the same. But if it said, is x plus 2 a factor, you would put negative 2 into your backward cell. Does that kind of make sense? So when you have the x there, you do the opposite. Thing. Okay, so 1, negative 2, negative 5, and 6. I get 3, 1, 3, negative 2, negative 6, 0. So 3 worked. And then I try the next one. 1, 1, negative 2, negative 5, and 6. So that one works as well. I could try an infinite number of numbers. How did I pick those four numbers? I don't know. Like, how did I decide to try negative 1, negative 2, uh, negative, or positive 3, and 1? I just gave those to you. Could I try anything? Like, could I try 7 now, 8? Yeah, you could try whatever. But I know that these are the only three. I have found three numbers that are zeros. How do I know that there's not any more? Talked about this briefly, yeah, Olivia? Because it was a degree three. Do you guys remember that? So if it's a degree three, the most zeros that you're going to have is three. So we have found all three zeros. Now, I don't have to do this every single time. I could have actually stopped right here. Once I saw this first one, once I saw that I got um, a remainder of zero, what I do is I then factor. I say this was the x plus two. The quotient was x squared minus 4x plus three. And then what do I do to the x squared minus 4x plus 3? I don't plug. You could, I guess you could do it again with synthetic division. Or you can factor it, right? Do you guys see how you get x equals 3? That one. And you get x equals 1? That one is your other two answers. Okay, so that's going to be kind of what we're going to be doing the rest of the chapter. We're going to hopefully have one that we get right away. It's going to break apart our polynomial into factors, and we're going to continue to factor, factor, factor until we get all of them. And it's, I think it's really cool. <laughs> Maybe you guys don't think it's cool. My, my definition of cool is very different than yours. But uh, basically, look at this, this function that we had. p of x equals x cubed minus 2x squared minus 5x plus 6. Can we split the middle on that? No. It doesn't work with split the middle. But we still can factor it, can't we? 
it's just a weird way it uses synthetic division. So I think that's very interesting. OK, so next one, number three. So find a polynomial of degree three with zeros of negative one, one, and three. So this is going the other way. It's telling us the zeros, and it's saying, well, what is the polynomial then? OK, and we've done this before. We did this in chapter six with the parabolas. OK, so we have the zeros. So remember, we always write it as x minus the zero, x minus the zero, et cetera. OK, so I'm going to have x minus a negative one. So I'm going to have x plus one as a factor x minus 1 and x minus 3. Always x minus 0. Is it equal to 0 or equal to? It's going to be equal to f of x or p of x or whatever. We're creating a polynomial. OK, and you want to choose your battles. Now, personally, I think multiplying the x plus 1 and the x minus 1 together first is very easy, because I know when I multiply those, what do I get? x squared minus 1. So if I multiply these two together, I get x squared minus 1, because it's x squared minus 1x plus 1x minus 1, right? The outer and inner cancel. It's the difference of two squares. I wouldn't want to multiply two things where I have a trinomial, and then I have to now multiply by a binomial. You see how what I'm talking about? It's, it's more difficult if you multiply the other ones first. Okay, so now we have that. So again, we FOIL. So I take my x squared times my x, I get x cubed. x squared times negative 3, I get negative 3x squared. Negative 1 times x is negative x, and negative 1 times negative 3 is plus 3. That's my polynomial, so I write p of x equals, or f of x equals, or what? Okay, so we can also have harder ones where we have not only the three zeros, like I have x plus 2 because I need negative 2 to be a 0. I need x minus 5 and I need x minus 2, but I might also say something about a leading coefficient. So on that last example that I did, I could have had any number out front. I could have snuck a 5 in here and then multiplied everything through by 5. It doesn't matter. I call that the simplest polynomial where there's not like the leading coefficient is just 1. Okay, but I could have had any number. There's an infinite number of polynomials that have those three zeros. Okay, so same thing here. I could have an infinite number, but since I said a leading coefficient of 3, it means I need a 3 off front. So we'll deal with that at the very end. So be smarter than the system. You don't want to multiply x plus 2 times x minus 5 first, because you'd have a trinomial. What two do you want to multiply together first? This one? Yeah, you want those ones, right? Because you know when you multiply those together, you get x squared minus 4. It's much easier if you have a binomial. Because then we can just FOIL. So x squared times x is x cubed. x squared times negative 5 is negative 5x squared. Negative 4 times x is negative 4x and then plus 20. But we're not done because right now this has a leading coefficient of 1. And we need that leading coefficient of 3. So we take my entire polynomial and we multiply through by the 3. So our polynomial ends up being 3x cubed minus 15x squared minus 12x plus 60. Yes? Uh, because it's always x minus the 0. So it was like x minus a negative 2 was the first one, x minus the 5, x minus the 2. So that's why we wrote x plus 2 is the first one. Yeah, it kind of makes sense if you set it equal to 0, you get x equals 5 as a 0. Kind of weird. All right, so let's get a little bit harder. The other class has been grumpy about this. You're not going to be grumpy, are you? I know it's Monday. I know you're tired. You were really hoping for a snow day after the Super Bowl. <laughs> Didn't happen. You're here. Let's not be grumpy. We can handle this. Mm -hmm. So find the cubic polynomial with zeros of negative 2 plus 5i, negative 2 minus 5i, and negative 3. OK. So we, again, we're doing the x minus the 0, x minus the 0, right, for each one. OK, so when I write this, I'm going to do x minus, and in parentheses, I'm going to do negative 2 plus 5i. OK, why did I put parentheses? Yeah, it's like, it's, you got to subtract out the whole zero, right? It's a binomial. you got to make sure you subtract that entire zero out. So you have x minus a negative 2 minus 5i, and then x minus a negative 3, so I'm going to do x plus 3 on the end. 
Okay, so it's x minus each of the zeros. So this was the zero, this was the zero, and at negative three was the other zero. Okay, so we have too many parentheses, too much going on. So I'm going to distribute the first parentheses. So I'm going to have, or the first negative. I'm going to distribute it in there. So I'm going to have plus 2 minus 5i. And then I have x plus 2 plus 5i. So it's like that. And the i solutions will go in pairs. Okay, if I have negative 2 plus 5i, I'm also going to have negative 2 minus 5i. Do you guys remember the conjugates? We've talked about that before. So if I have 3 minus 2i as a 0, what else will I have? 3 plus 2i. So you'll use that on your homework. Like, I'll give you one of them. You'll also need the other one. But the regular integer answers don't go in pairs. Like, if I have negative 3 as a 0, I'm not also going to have positive 3. You see, it only works for the i's where you have pairs. It comes from the quadratic formula, remember? Okay, so anyway, so we have this. And we're going to multiply it out. Okay, this is going to take some work. You guys can do this, I promise. So you're going to take the x and you're going to multiply it in three times. How many terms am I, am I going to have when I take the, th the trinomial times the trinomial? More. Nine, right? Because I'm going to take the x times all three things. Then I'm going to take, take the two times all three things. And then, then I'm going to take the negative five times all three things. You guys try this along with me. Don't just copy what I'm doing. Think about it in your head. So x times x x squared, x times 2, 2x, x times 5i, 5i x. Now take the 2. Did you get it? See how it took you all of like 20 seconds to actually do? So you can complain about it for five minutes or you can just do it and it will take you 20, 20 seconds. It's not that bad. Now, if you do this correctly, because they're conjugates, everything that has an I will end up going away. So that's how you kind of know that you did it right. Okay, so let's look through. Do you guys see how you have a 5IX and you have a negative 5IX? And you have a 10i and you have a negative 10i. But then we still have that i squared. What's i squared equal to? Negative 1. So that means you really have a plus 25 on the end, right? Negative 25 times negative 1. So we have x squared. We have 2x plus 2x, so I get plus 4x. I have 4, and I have plus 25, so I get plus 29. But we still have that x plus 3, so we go one more time. It's not as bad as the first one. We got it. Okay, so I'm going to take the x squared times x. I'm going to get x cubed. x squared times 3 is 3x squared. 4x times x is 4x squared. 4x times 3 is 12x. 29 times x is 29x. 29 times 3 is 87. So your final polynomial is x cubed plus 7x squared plus 41x plus 87. It's a little bit tricky, but it's not anything that you don't know how to do. You know how to do that. Okay, and then the very last one, it says, if you are given that 2 is a 0, can you find the other two zeros? Okay, so remember I told you the whole point of this is once we find one of the zeros, we are able to factor a polynomial. So even though this one looks like it doesn't factor, like you can't slip a metal on it, it looks like it's unfactorable, you actually can factor it. So we do it with synthetic division. So if I'm given that two works, I go ahead and I put it in my synthetic division. I drop the one. 1 times 2 is 2, add straight down I get 9, 2 times 9 is 18, add straight down I get 20, 2 times 20 is 40, add straight down I get 0. So my original, the x cubed plus 7x squared plus 2x minus 40 has now been factored into the divisor and the quotient. So my divisor was x minus 2, my quotient is x squared plus 9x plus 20. So I factor, I have x plus 5, 
and I have x plus 4. That allows me to find the three zeros. Remember, it's an x cubed equation, so there are three solutions. I get 2, negative 5, and negative 4. So that's what we'll be doing like the rest of the chapter. We'll be taking something, using synthetic division, factor, 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 until we get the final. Now what happens if we try, you know, if we had x to the fourth at the beginning, and we try two and it works, it factors it, but then we still have an x cubed that we don't know how to factor. Well, then we go again, right? So we're going to take these big, long polynomials that look like you can't factor them, and we're going to break them down.